Welcome back guys. This uh, portion will contain three chapter of our module or of our handouts because those chapter is uh, they have minimal or yes of course they have less uh, number of discussion compared to the previous topics that we have discussed. So for today uh, the chapter that is covered by this presentation is chapter 8 uh, eight, nine, and I think that is eight, nine, and ten. So, discussing the methodology that is applied in criminal detection or criminal investigation, or it is of course uh, under the study of uh, forensic chemistry and toxicology. So, talking about metallurgy, that is the extraction or extraction, or that is the knowledge or the working knowledge about metals, and now the utilization of chemicals and physical physical knowledge when it comes to the study of different types of metals. For the metallography, that is the branch of uh, metallurgy that will now study the composition or the microstructure of metals and alloys. So commonly, metallurgy is very important when we are talking about robbery, theft, hit and run, bomb explosion, nail explosions, counterfeit, counterfeited coins, and of course the most common or the famous uh, portion or the famous uh, thing in which uh, metallurgy is applied that is the restoration of tampered restoration of tampered serial numbers so that is the most common thing or the most common uh, instances in which we are now going to apply the knowledge of metallurgy so in layman's term in the restoration of tampered serial numbers we are going to refer it or we are going to define it as macro aging for counterfeited coins, uh, there are two ways on how to uh, create counterfeited coins. Number one is cast coins and number two is trap coins. So if you are talking about cast coins, there is now a mold, meaning there is now a shape that will now correspond to the appearance of the coin and they will now put the, it's either metals, it's either copper in order to create coins. If you are talking about struck coins, there is now a metal in which uh, it corresponds to the shape of the coin and it will now hit the uh, the metal sheet in order for the coin to, in order for the, what do you call that, in order for the metal to stamp on that uh, metal. So that is the two way in how to create counterfeited coins that is through cast. There is now a mold that will now correspond the shape of the coin or the appearance of the coin. While struck coins, there is now a metal that corresponds to the shape and appearance of the coin and it will stamp on the metal in order for the appearance of the coin will be embedded on that metal. So going to the main topic that uh, I said a while ago that the most common uh, thing in which uh, metallurgy is being applied that is of course the restoration of tampered serial numbers. There are uh, many ways on how to determine if your serial number is uh, tampered or it is altered or it, that is not the original uh, serial number of your vehicle or motorcycle. For the serial numbers, we can uh, locate them on what we call the engine number and we have the chassis number. So the same in motorcycles or tricycles, it has the motorcycle also have the uh, chassis number and uh, engine number. So that is the most common areas or that is the areas in which uh, serial numbers is being uh, tampered. So of course, those uh, serials, serial number is very hard to change or it is very hard to remove because uh, there is now a special, uh, of course, a, a special devices that is uh, uh, that will now put the numbers on the vehicles or motorcycle in which it is very impossible for you to erase them because uh, the thickness of the uh, metal, that is also the thickness of the number, uh, the number that is, uh, or the number, the letters, or the serial number that is placed in the vehicle or motorcycle. So it is very hard for it to be tampered. So commonly, there are different methods on how to tamper the serial numbers and uh, we cannot uh, uh, discuss them because there are many ways on how to uh, tamper serial number and that is not the main focus of the discussion 
the main focus of the discussion is now the restoration of the tamper serial number. So how can you determine if your serial number is tampered? Number one, the lettering is not aligned. Commonly, if that is original serial number, of course, all the letterings or all the number on your chassis and on your engine is on the same level. Num uh, next one is the letterings or yes, the letterings that is uh, placed on the chassis or engine number. It should be the same in sizes, meaning there is no small, there is no large, all of them will be the same in sizes. And of course, there should be uh, the same, of course, in appearance, meaning if that is aerial, all of them which should be in aerial fan. If it is in other fans, it should be the same from one another. So, meaning if you are going to examine your engine number and chassis number in which it is not aligned, there is small and there is big, and there is different ways on how to represent the letterings, uh, there is a possibility that your chassis number or engine number is tampered. Uh, next one is, it is uh, there is scratches on it in which you cannot determine and or you cannot read the letterings that is placed on the engine number and your uh, chassis number. And there are many ways and there are many methods on how to determine if your chassis or engine number is tampered. Uh, so the general rule is if you cannot read, if there is alteration, if there is scratches that you cannot read the numbers or the lettering that is uh, embedded on your chassis or engine number, there is now a sign or uh, you should think that there is a possibility that your chassis or engine number is tampered. So how do, so commonly you can uh, submit your vehicles or motorcycles subject to macro itching in the crime laboratory in order for them to place an itching materials or itching fluids or itching chemicals in order to remove the tampered materials or remove the letterings that is placed on it and if of course restore the original number on your vehicle but there is now the possibility that your vehicle or motorcycle will be confiscated because of course it is tampered meaning it is car up it is motor nap, meaning you need to surrender it in the crime laboratory. That's why if you want to change the uh, the name of the vehicle that, or motorcycle that you have, uh, of course, buy from uh, other person, you need to, of course, register it to the land, tra land transportation office. And of course, you need to secure different kinds of certification from the highway patrol group and from the crime laboratory in order for them to validate that the vehicle you have buy, of course, is not car nap or motor nap. So uh, what will be the process that will be undergone uh, on your vehicle or on your motorcycle in order or there is a suspicion that your serial number or engine uh, engine number or uh, chassis number is tampered. So there are different itching fluids that will be placed or, or it will be applied on your chassis or engine number in order to restore the original chassis and engine number. So for cast and iron, take note that the composition or the metals that is uh, used in order to create the vehicle, so for they differ from one another. It, depend, it depends on the vehicle, it depends on the brand and so on and so forth. So for vehicle or motorcycle that is made up from iron or steel, the itching fluids that is utilized is 10% sulfuric, sulfuric acid and potassium dichromate and so on and so forth. So for the characteristics of the vehicle, for the metal that is utilized in the vehicle, so there are different itching devices that, or itching chemicals that you are going to utilize. So the process of restoring the tamper serial number, we term it as macro itching. So there are a lot, a lot of uh, metals and there are a lot, of course, of itching fluids that will be applied on your engine or chassis number in order to restore the original serial numbers. So for wrought iron and forged iron, that is solution number one. So if you are going to talk about solution number one, the composition of it is uh, hydrochloric acid in ATML water or yes, hydrochloric acid that is ATML that is placed on water that is 60 ml. We have cupric uh, chloride that is 2.9 grams and alcohol 
that is 50 ml that is the solution number one for solution number two it comprises only of 15 percent nitric acid for aluminum that is glycerin 30 ml nitrate acid for 10 ml and hydrochloric acid for 20 ml for lead that is three parts of glacial acetic acid and one part of water for stainless steel that is dilute sulfuric acid or 10 percent hydrochloric acid in alcohol for copper brass silver and other copper alloy that is the utilization of uh, ferric chloride that is in 19 grams the hydrochloric acid 6 ml and we have you need to add water that is 10 ml for tin, 10% hydrochloric acid. For zinc, 10% sodium hydroxide. For silver, concentrate, concentrated nitric acid. For gold and platinum, that is aqua regia. For aqua regia, that comprises of three parts hydrochloric acid and one part nitric acid. For wood, of wood is uh, included even though it is not uh, metal. It is included that is included for, of course, uh, educational purposes for wood commonly that is only a jet of steam or the pressure coming from water we can uh, immediately restore the serial numbers so in addition if you are in doubt on the motorcycle or on the vehicle that you buy uh, you just need to what you call that to bring out the uh, cr number or the certificate of registration of your uh, vehicle or motorcycle then look into the chassis number and engine number and after that you need to look into the chassis and engine number on your vehicle so commonly it is uh, on the engine part and on the chassis part so you need, need to locate on the numbers on it and you need to look or it should be matched from one another if not there is a possibility that the motor vehicle you have buy or but it's either it is car nap or motor nap. Next, we are now going to chapter 9 of our module or handouts that is the discussion of soil or petro petrography as applied for in criminal investigation or criminal detection. For the definition of petrography, that is the branch of geography that will now study or deal with the systematic classification, identification of rocks, rock forming uh, minerals, and soil. So we are going to study uh, rocks, soil, and other forms of minerals in this uh, chapter of our module. So commonly, the importance of soil examination or petrography in criminal detection, of course, not all soil from the Philippines is the same. There is now a variation of soil coming from different parts of the Philippines. So in Cordillera, there is different kinds of minerals and there is different kinds or types of soil in Cordillera compared to Region 1, Region 2, Region 3, and other regions in the Philippines. Meaning, if we have collected the uh, pieces of evidence when it comes to soil or minerals, we can examine the original location or the, pers uh, the person whereabouts or where the perpetrator committed the crime and when it transferred uh, to another crime and so on and so forth. And of course, the addition of uh, other uh, materials in soil. For example, the soil in soil, there is now the addition of corn. So commonly, this person is either he walk in a corn field because there is corn on the sole of his shoes. Uh, in uh, in and what, uh, there is now the combination of soil and corn, meaning this person is of course uh, he might be he might go in uh, in our corn field and so on and so. Forth. So that is now the relevancy of petrography in criminal detection. So that it doesn't only focus on minerals, it doesn't focus on soil and rocks, it also focuses on other matters in which soil and other particles uh, combine. So we can arrive at the circumstantial evidence in which there is a possibility that this person came from this place because of the pieces of evidence that is extracted from him or that is uh, left on his clothing or in his belongings when he go on that area. 
for types of soil, there are three. We have alluvial, we have colluvial, and we have sedentary soil. For alluvial, that uh, that is soil, uh, commonly the soil is uh, washed, it's either by water, by wind, and so on and so forth. Commonly alluvial soil is the term as the moving or they are migratory soils. For colluvial, this is a uh, form, the composition, the composition of ignos, metamorphic, and sedimentary. So our key term is the composition. So if we are going to study petrography, uh, in-depth study of petrography, we can uh, learn about how do rock, soil, and other mineral minerals decompose. So if uh, ignos, metamorphic, sedimentary, rocks, other minerals is decomposed, we term it as colluvial soils. So for sedentary soil, uh, if this soil or minerals is not uh, moving or it is not migratory, it is inactive, commonly we term them as sedentary soils. For the collection and submission of soil, soil is usually, of course, in a form of mud, and uh, usually it is uh, present on our shoes, slipper, clothing, tires, tools, and furniture. So that is the most common areas in which we are going to extract soil evidence if uh, we are looking into soil or if we are talking if we are looking into the comparison of uh, soil evidence that is collected from the perpetrator and that is collected from the crime scene next if found of course on the above soil should remain in place and the whole uh, sub and the whole should be submitted in the crime laboratory meaning if this is the stripper and there is now the uh, there is now mud or there is soil that is deposited deposited in it. Uh, no, there's no need to scrape the mud or soil on the slipper. You need to collect the whole evidence. So you need to include the slipper, the shoes, and so on and so forth that the soil is deposited. That is the general rule or standard operating procedure. Next, should be wrapped in a clean paper or filter paper and placed in a box. So commonly, it is not, it, it is not placed on a plastic bag or evidence bag that is made up of plastic because of the uh, because of uh, the accumulation of moisture when it is now directly in contact with the sunlight. So if there is now uh, in contact with water, uh, commonly the evidence will, of course, will be contaminated. Next, known soil sample and should be taken at different places around the point of reference. So commonly, of course, if you have collected uh, soil evidence in a specific area, you need to separate it from the other pieces of evidence that is collected from another area. So of course, that is the general rule. Next, another different or classification of rock. Uh, a while ago, we discussed about the classification of soil. Now, we are now talking about the classification of rocks. We have igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary or sandstone. So, igneous, that is commonly com uh, produced by volcanic. Uh, volcanic or that is created by it's either intense or tremendous amount of heat. For metamorphic rock, it undergo change in texture through pressure, heat, chemical reaction. So commonly, this uh, type of rock undergoes different uh, processes in order for it to be formed. It's either pressure, heat, chemicals. So uh, the common example of this type of rock is limestone. And uh, limestone, of course, that turns into marble because of pressure. Next. We have sedentary rocks. So commonly, sedentary rocks is formed with the sediments of rocks. So commonly, it is either sand because rocks, if they are, uh, what do you call that, uh, turn into sediments, they, of course, become too small. So we call them as sedimentary rocks from the term itself. From rock, it forms into small pieces of sediments. That's why it is called a sedimentary rock. So the most common example of sedimentary rocks are sands because sands comprises of stones that break into pieces 
uh, that creates small gravel of rocks. So we call them as sedentary rocks or sandstones. For the consti uh, constituents of soil, so um, there's no need to examine in depth when it comes to the constituents of uh, soil. As long as you know the different classification, you know how to differentiate the different types of soil, it is enough. Because the in uh, criminal and or in forensic chemistry and toxicology, we only our aim is to know a little bit about this topic because in law enforcement or as a future in uh, future law enforcers uh, later on uh, a bit knowledge on the pieces of evidence uh, pieces of evidence how to preserve it is enough because the uh, what we call that the right person that we're going to examine these pieces of evidence is the chemist that is employed by the uh, crime laboratory office meaning uh, as a criminology student the your aim in this subject is to know uh, just a little bit on the background of this subject in order for you to preserve the evidence in order for the chemist to properly examine it and of course to either free the innocent or convict the guilty party. Nothing! Next, for the preliminary minerals, we have important classification of minerals. We have quartz, calcites or we term them as limestone we have feldspar or we call them as silicate of aluminum or sodium or barium calcium or potassium we have dolomite limestone we have mica and we have other primary minerals such as gypsum talc calonite limonite and magnetite we have also clay minerals Clay minerals is characteristics or their characteristics is this is the decomposition of preliminary minerals. So if quartz, calcites, and other minerals will decompose, commonly they, be, they become clays. We have our, our organic constituents. So organic constituents this is the most variable of soil constituents and are of uh, peculiar importance in the identification of soils. So commonly, if you are, we are going to study soil or we are going to study soil evidence, the most important thing that we are going to examine, of course, the organic constituent of the soil in order for them to classify what is the difference from the uh, collected evidence or the pieces of evidence and of course the other type of soils. So we are only going to examine the organic particles of soil in order for them to be classified from one another. For the analysis of soil commonly, there are different methods in order for them to be analyzed. Number one, or there are three different uh, analysis of soil that is uh, employed in order for them to be categorized from one another. We have X-ray diffraction, we have spectrographic analysis, and we have thermal analysis. So commonly, this uh, uh, this is used for commercial and private uh, laboratory for general procedures and of course the crime laboratory of course they have ex, uh, the, this different type of uh, examinations in order for them to classify the different types of soil that is submitted to them for the uh, dust and dirt we also include dust and dirt in the analysis of soils because they are related to one another so if you're talking about dust it is a matter which is dry and finely divided form if you are talking about mud of course this is a uh, soil that is mixed with water for grime or heavy dirt commonly when dust is moved with the sweat and grease of human body grime is now formed so there is dust it is now uh, mixed with our uh, with the sweat or grease on our uh, body or on the human body, we call it as grime or heavy dirt. For the classification of dust, we have dust deposited from air. We have uh, the road or the dust that is coming from road or food pathways. We have industrial dust and we have occupational dust. For its uh, definition, we can immediately uh, classify them from the term itself. Dust deposited from air, 
we have road or road foot pathways, we have industrial dust and we have occupational dust. We can immediately uh, differentiate them from one another through its uh, title or through its uh, name alone. For the collection and submission of dust and dirt, commonly dust or dirt is present on the clothing. So, of course, the whole article should be collected, including the dust or dirt that is uh, deposited on it. And it should be uh, submitted to the crime laboratory in order for it to be analyzed. So, of course, we can also use vacuum in order to back, uh, in order to extract, in order to collect pieces of evidence that is dust and dirt, in order for it to be easily accumulated. Of course, we can see dust. Uh, so the easiest way in order for it to be uh, collected is through the use of vacuum or if, uh, different uh, equipments or devices that can accumulate dust or dirt. For the analysis of dust, there are different uh, chemicals that is utilized and the common analysis that we are going to use is the quantitative examination. So it comprises of numbers or volume. So for the examination of sa uh, samples, it is uh, first uh, uh, being uh, observed through the use of uh, ultraviolet light followed by the treatment of a small quantity with a drop of water on a spot plate and it will now observe on a microscope in order to differentiate the different particle that is present on dust. After that, it will be treated on a 0.1 hydrochloric acid and the following uh, note, note will be taken. Number one is the evolution of gases, the formation of precipitate, the change in color, the minerals dissolved by acid. Number four, of course, the treatment of a small quantity with ethanol and of course they will now classify the dust and dirt that is collected from the crime scene and from the standard specimen. For the gunpowder and explosive, commonly it will be discussed with your ballistics uh, subject but we will still discuss it in our subject. For the question document examination, there is a question document examination part on our module but I believe that Sir Felix is it and I know you are very knowledgeable in it. That's why I didn't uh, include it in the presentation. For the gunpowder and uh, uh, gunpowders, uh, we have two types of gunpowder. We have black and we have smokeless powder. If you're talking about the differentiation of two, uh, black accumulate a tremendous amount of gases if the firearms issued. While smokeless, it doesn't mean if that the name of the powder is smokeless that the firearm, if you are going to shoot it, there will be the absence or there is no production of smoke. There will be still uh, smoke that will produce if you are going to use smokeless gases but in minimal amount. That is the differentiation of black powder and smokeless powder. Another differentiation of black powder is smokeless powder. That is the composition. The chemical composition of uh, black powder that is now the composition of 15% charcoal, 10% sulfur, and 75% potassium or sodium nitrate. While uh, smokeless powder, it, uh, it comprises of cellulose nitrate or glyceryl nitrate or yes glyceryl nitrate that is combined with cellulose nitrate so and other stabilizers in order to create of course smokeless powder so uh, uh, clarification again that uh, black powder and smokeless powder create smoke it doesn't mean that we, should, we say smokeless from the term less uh, from the term it's less, meaning there is no the absence of smoke. No, that is not the uh, story. So smokeless powder, it creates smoke, but minimal amount compared to black powder that it creates tremendous amount of smoke when it is now fired. For the possible location of nitrates, if you are talking about uh, nitrates and nitrites, that is now the uh, chemical composition of gunpowder, and that is now the burn composition of gunpowder, nitrates and nitrites, in which that is now the subject of our uh, topic today, in which that is now 
the thing that we are going to extract from the suspect or from the fire or from the uh, victim in order to collect nitrates and nitrates on the body of the victim that will now show that there is now the presence of gunpowder on it. For uh, the presence of gunpowder, we can locate it in the residue of the barrel. So barrel that is the inside of the firearm in which we can locate the lance and grooves of the firearms or the rifflings of the firearms that is around the wound. Yes, we can uh, extract nitrates and nitrites on the wound of the victim. On the clothings of the person fired, uh, the firearm is either the clothing of the fire or the clothing of the victim if that is a close, uh, if that is close range. Next, on the exposed surface of the hand of the person being fired. So commonly if you're firing the gun, the most common exposed area is this area, if you shoot the firearm. For the factors that affect the presence and amount of gunpowder, so commonly there is a possibility that the shooter, even though he shoots firearm, there is now the absence of gunpowder on him. It's either you didn't shoot a firearm, but there is now the presence of gunpowder on your body. So what are the different factors that will explain that phenomena? Number one, the type and caliber of ammunition. Different types of ammunition fired on the same weapon and from the same distance may give different factors. So commonly, uh, ammunition or caliber, the type and caliber of ammunition commonly it different from, or there is the different, there is different classification of ammunition. There is 9mm, there is 45, there is M16, and so on and so forth. So commonly, uh, from different types of ammunition, the amount of gunpowder in it will differ from different, uh, from one another. Next, the length of barrel of the gun. A weapon with two inches barrel will deposit residue over a large area than weapon having a five inches. So commonly, uh, that is two inches barrel, it will spread uh, residue from a larger area. Compared to long barrel, so commonly, that if that is a long barrel, it will deposit uh, residue from a, uh, a smaller areas. Uh, from distance of the muzzle to the target, of course, the muzzle is the end of the firearm and to the target. Of course, if you are very far, far from your target, the, uh, the residue will not be deposited on your target. If you are closer, of course, the gunpowder will be deposited on your target. Next, humidity. Yes, humidity. There is now the rapidity of uh, the powder being burned if there is now the uh, less humidity on it if there is no large uh, tremendous humidity on that uh, area there is no the possibility that gunpowder will burn slowly for wind velocity of course yes you shoot the firearm and immediately there is wind blown on it so commonly there it will be the absence of gunpowder on your body because it is blown away by the wind Direction of the firing, of course. Uh, commonly, uh, the direction of the fire is, is downward. The gunpowder will be deposited. If it is outward, commonly it will fall down. So commonly, the the, uh, the residue will not be deposited on the uh, on the victim or on the target because of the uh, angle or the direction of the fire. For the determination of whether or not a person fired a gun with his bare hands. So commonly, that is now the utilization of paraffin test. So take note that paraffin test is very obsolete. And paraffin test is inconclusive. Why paraffin test is inconclusive? Take note that even though you didn't fire a gun, there is a possibility that you will be positive on this type of test. Why? Because paraffin test will be positive on uh, different uh, chemicals that there is not the presence of nitrates and nitrites. So fertilizer have nitrates, uh, cosmetics have nitrates, urine have nitrates or sulfuric or other particles that can be detected by paraffin test. So paraffin test is conclusive but it is a corroborative, corroborative evidence in order for the uh, police officer or investigator how to have a lead, lead or he or she will have a lead on the 
the incident that happened or transpired in which whether you fired a gun or not. So commonly, paraffin test will not be admissible in court. It will not be admissible in court because uh, just like what I said a while ago, it is inconclusive. It is inconclusive because even though you didn't fire a gun, it will uh, be you will be positive if there is no presence of nitrates on your hand. So paraffin test is also termed as diphenylamine test and other names that is associated to it. So the theory when it comes to paraffin test, actually if you fire the gun, there is no heat uh, or the nitrates uh, of course will be burning or nitrates will be burned it will be deposited on your skin. If your skin will be heated, your pores will open. And if your pores will open, the nitrates will be deposited on your pores. And if your hand will uh, cool down, it will now trap the nitrates on your pores. So in order to remove those uh, nitrates that is the uh, trap on your skin, you need to apply Hit on it. So that's why the uh, application of paraffin wax. So if you are going to apply paraffin wax on your skin, so there is heat, so your pores will reopen and the nitrates will be deposited on the uh, paraffin wax. And of course, uh, the paraffin cast that is lifted on your hands, there will now a diphenylamine reagent that is placed on your on the wax that is collected on you. And if there is now what we call the blue specks on the paraffin cast that is lifted on you, meaning that you are positive to uh, nitrates or nitrites. So this is now the, uh, what we call that, the reagents and the procedure in order to, uh, what we call that, in order to undergo diphenylamine test, paraffin test, dermal nitrate test, blanche test, and so on and so forth, name for this test. So the procedure is of course for the paraffin test that is explained a while ago, the same that is explained a while ago. So the most common that you are going to use on this test is of course the use of paraffin wax. Uh, there is now a var uh, variation when we are going to use the dipilylamine test. Why? Because there is now the different reagent that is now going to utilize. So commonly, there is now the use of diphenylamine reagent. We have uh, 10 ml sulfuric acid and 20 ml of water. So just what I said a while ago, it is the visible result for this type of test is the blue specks or deep blue specks and so on and so forth as long as it is blue specks that is positive to nitrates. And of course, there is now the limitation of the test that is uh, said a while ago that even though you didn't fire a gun, there is a possibility for you to be positive on this test by merely the presence or by merely, of course, the presence of nitrates or nitrates on your skin through cosmetics, urine, fertilizers, and so on and so forth. That's a, that has the chemical composition that is the same to that powder. So, so this uh, explanation is uh, explained a while ago, so there's no need to re reiterate it again. Or, okay, this is the other factors in which a person, he fired a gun, but it found out that he is now negative to Night try. So commonly, he used automatic pistol, the direction of the wind, wind velocity, excessive uh, precipitation of perspiration on the part of the person or on the shooter. It's either he used gloves or it's either the person has a knowledge on the chemicals that will now remove nitrates on his body. So commonly, uh, if this person is a chemist, he can now determine or he can formulate chemicals or he knows different chemicals that will now remove nitrates on our skin in order for you. If you are going to subject to uh, paraffin test, you will be negative even though you fired the gun. So that is the advantage of uh, being on that field because you you can, of course, pwede mong takasan yung kaso if you are knowledgeable within it. 
Pero wag niyo wag niyo gagawin yun. Don't be involved in crimes, of course. And of course, uh, we can only detect nitrates and nitrates on a person less than 72 hours prior or after the incident. After that, of course, we cannot detect the presence of nitrates on his or her skin because he perspire or uh, he undergoes different uh, activities that will now uh, extract or that will now remove the nitrates that is deposited on his or her body. For the determination of uh, the range or the distance of the firearms in which held to the victim or from the time it discharged, of course, the examination of the clothing and the wound of the victim will be uh, sufficient or that is now the most common area that will uh, be examined in order to determine the range of the shooter. So the collection and preservation of clothing in which there is now the presence of gunpowder or nitrates or nitrates on it. Of course, you need to collect the whole article. You need to place it on a paper bag and place it on a box in order for it to be free from any contamination and in order to uh, secure its integrity. So, for the determination of probable gunshot range, so if that is uh, distant or that is close range, we can immediately see singeing. If we are talking about singeing, that is the slightly burning of the skin. So close range, if there is singeing, we term it as singeing if there is no slight burning on the skin of the victim. If smudging, if we are talking about smudging, there is now a black area that is round on the skin of the person that where the bullet hole enters or where the bullet enters we call term it as bullet hole we call it as much as there is a black collar on it or there is a black uh, it's either collar it's either u-shape it's either so circle shape we term it as matching if you're talking about tattooing or powder tattooing there is now spot spot on the skin of the bird or on the skin of the victim we term it as, as powder tattooing because of the nitrates nitrites or the gunpowder that is exiting on the barrel of the firearm or on the muzzle of the firearm it is very hot if it will in contact with skin of course it will now burn our skin it will penetrate it and of course will it will create small holes on the skin of the victim so we term it as powder tattooing so singeing smudging tattooing will determine that the firer and the victim is in close distance where the firearm is discharged for the three zone of distance from which the firearm was discharged so those in which the muzzle of the gun muzzle it should be muzzle not muzzle muzzle of the gun was held directly in contact with the body or partially so those in which the muzzle of the gun was held to inches to 36 inches away and those in which the muzzle of the gun muzzle of the gun dapat yan at sun was held beyond 36 inches so that is the close range this done distant range and of course the farthest distance in which the shooter and the victim is connect, uh, connected with one another of course we are talking about range for so there's no need to uh, discuss it uh, again. So we discuss what is smudging, singeing, and tattooing. For the again, this is the chemical test for gunpowder, diphenylamine or paraffin test. Na ulit na naman. I don't know bakit uh, the slide is uh, uh, ulit ulit na lang. There is repetition on the slides. So. Uh, gunshot range of weapon other than pistol and revolver, so commonly we have rifles, of course it can uh, uh, shoot its projectile from a distant range or from a long range because rifle can shoot from a long range because of its barrel. Shotgun or sport, sporting gun, commonly shotgun is utilized for close range because it's pellet. If you are going to shoot it with a long range, of course, it pellets, uh, 
there is the now the impossible for the palace to shoot its target. That's why shotgun is only intended for short range. For the determination of the probable time of the gun, if uh, when it is fired, so common, the common area or the common uh, thing that you are going to analyze in order to determine the time uh, when the shooter fires its gun, the suit, the metallic fragment, the rust, the nitrates, and nitrates. So commonly, the knowledge uh, for the examination of the probable time when the firearm is uh, fired is commonly it is not uh, prioritized because, of course, on the, uh, what we call that, in the uh, discovery of the body or discovery of the victim commonly is two days, three days, and so on and so forth. That's why this type of uh, topic is not very much uh, discussed because it is not uh, commonly used in uh, investigation. For the explosives, uh, explosive is any substance that may cause an explosion by its sudden decomposition or combustion. For the classification of explosive, it is classified into two. We have from viewpoint of chemical composition and from the functioning characteristics. So for the classification of explosive, we have from the viewpoint of uh, chemical composition, there are three classifications. We have inorganic. We have organic and we have mixture of oxidized materials and oxidizing agent that is no explosive separately. So from the term inorganic, of course, the chemical composition of the bomb is, uh, uh, what you call that, it is of course uh, created in the laboratory while organic, it can be extracted from the uh, plants or from other, other living matters. For the uh, classification of explosives, if we are now going to talk about the functioning characteristics, we have the propellant or low explosives. We are talking about propellant or low explosives. The example of this is the pyrotechnics, the uh, ex explosives that is used during New Year, that is pyrotechnics. We have black powder, smokeless powder, firecrackers, and so on and so forth. That is characteristic characterized as low explosive. For primary explosives, those uh, type of uh, explosives that can create uh, shock or that can create, it's either heat or shock upon detonation. So commonly we have the mercury fulminate and we have lead aside. For the high explosives, uh, these explosives cannot uh, immediately explode without prior without explosion coming from primary explosives so it is not sensitive to shock it is not sensitive to heat so there is a need for it to be uh, there is a need for the explosion of primary explosive in order for the type for this type of explosive to explode so we the characteristics of it or the different type of it you have ammonium nitrate dynamite tnt or what we call trinitrotoluene we have nitroglycerin we have plastic explosive and we have pitric acid other explosive we have c4 uh, we have rdx or we have the trinitro trizacyclopezane we have uh, chloroxetophenol, we have fire bombs. So commonly fire bombs, there are three classifications. We have Molotov cocktail, we have modern Molotov, we have acid, and we have the mixture of alcohol and gasoline. So commonly Molotov, it is originated in Russia. And the appearance of it is just a bottle, and there is no uh, gasoline in it, and it is ignited. And of course, commonly thrown by thrown and if the glass breaks, of course, the fire will now spread because of the presence of gasoline in it. We have the composition of fragmentation explosives. We have composition number one, composition B, or composition A, B, C, C2, C3, and we have C4. So commonly it uh, is characterized on the explosive or how dangerous or uh, the explosive, how 
do the function or how much or the destruction of this explosive is characterized by uh, letters or characterized by the uh, destru destruction that is being made by these explosives. So uh, we are now finishing the discussion. We have th three chapters left and we are now ready for our finals and midterms examination. So I hope that you are doing well with your study. I hope that you understand our discussion. And if you have uh, questions with our topics, if you have a clarification with our topic, just chat me or just ask on our uh, group chat in order for you to clarify the things you, that you didn't understand or you need to ask questions in which, uh, of course, you want to ask. So that's it for now. Thank you and God bless.